everybody's sitting on the couch with a with a fucking idea, Ryan. How did you kind of take that leap to think, okay, I need to figure out a brick and mortar space. There's a real estate component. I need to figure out how to get these devices. I need to figure out the cleanliness, the sanitation, the ingredients, the processes, the procedures, you know, starting the the business corporation. How did you kind of take that step after the ideation around, man, people are getting benefit from this that I, I feel and I want others to receive that because that's a great visionary piece. But mm-hmm. then there's, you know, the, the building blocks behind the scenes that most people don't see. Yeah, I think it's not getting caught into all the checklist things you need to do. And it's like, you know, it's a, it's a very simple statement. Everyone probably hears it, but it's like, just do the next thing in front of you. Mm-hmm. Like that, that's literally it. Like whether you're Elon Musk to someone starting a bakery, like it, you're literally just, you'll figure out like the thing, like you said, how do I, you know, get a, how do I file for an LLC? How do I, you know, go through uh, general contractor negotiations. I had no clue, you know, and I still wonder if I even have a clue, but it's like, you just kind of do it. Um, and I don't think I'm an expert at it, but I, I think some of the things that have helped me is, you know, speak it outward, like say the things you're like, not the grandiose, like that's fine. You could say, I'm going to build a global company and I'm going to do this, but like, just say the thing that you're going to do in that process. And then people, we, we naturally get, we hold ourselves to that level. We tend to, you know, our word is important who we are. People want to, we want people to believe us. So I think it's important to say like, Hey, I'm going to do this. Um, and you just kind of do it and you figure it out along the way. There's no real magic. I wish there was a way you go to school and you learn all these things and you, 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 whatever that school is, it just doesn't exist. It's literally like you talked about it earlier. It's the, it's the act of, do, it's the act of just being in action and doing the thing. And it's, you know, I think we get caught up into what step 10 is and step 10 will present itself when step 10, like it's no point of even thinking about that because the first thing to do is, well, 10 will unfold. Step 10 will come. It might be, you know, for me, a float center, how it started, man, it was like, step one was okay, floating. And then it was, um, you know, for me, it was a business plan. And I, I did a business plan for like six months, which was probably longer. I got into the actual research phase, which I think a lot of us get stuck in. It's kind of this perfectionism. It's actually, you know, we're actually scared to actually do the big next step. So the, the business plan was, you know, I, like I said, I spent six months, every projection detail, every code, everything that was interesting, but I was doing a research project. I wasn't actually getting down to the action spot. And to me, the action was I needed to raise money. Like I didn't have money to start a float center. So it was like, how the hell do I go get this $300,000 that I need to start this company that I don't have? And that was actually what I was afraid to do. And the business plan was important. It showed there was a level that needed to get done of commitment. So people knew, believed that I knew what I was talking about. But at the end of the day, I actually just needed to go talk to people and start selling them on this concept of floating and what I think it could do and my them getting to believe me that I'm going to see this project through. And I was afraid to be told no. So that was my thing that kind of held me back of like people not believing in me and facing that rejection. And once I got on the court there, then things started to unfold. Then, you know, I got a bunch of no's and then I finally got a yes. And I remember being like, came out of nowhere. A buddy's like, dude, I, I got 15 grand. I'll give you. I was like, Whoa, this guy's going to give me $15,000. Like what do I bet? It's like, I'm fucking making this happen now. And then it's like, then you get a little more confidence and then I'm on to the next one. And that pitch is a little bigger. And then I get, you know, $40,000 on this. Ne- you know, it's like it builds. So it's like, just get the little W's along the way and momentum becomes when you have it, never relinquish it and respect the process to get it because it doesn't just happen and you got to work for it. But when you just stay consistent, you will get momentum. I love the way you describe that, man. There's a, a famous statement. There's so many things that I want to unpack from what you said, but the first one is there is magic in there. 
And the magic is, I heard this from somebody, I forgot who, but the word is abracadabra. It's an Aramaic term that means with my word, I create. Mm. You put the spoken word out and now it becomes real. It's not just playing ping pong in your head anymore. It's kind of like writing fills the gaps within our thinking. These are things that I like to say a lot. But when you say it out loud, you're like, oh, that actually creates action. And I mean, I say to people all the time, you'll learn more from door to door knock in sales or, or cold calling people. You'll learn more in a thousand calls than you will from reading any sales book. Because there's an emotional component. There's an expectation that you're trying to get to. But those no's and the, the body language and, you know, the analogy of getting the door slammed on your face or the phone hung up on you, you know, you can, you can feel that at your core. But then yep. that first yes, you're like, whoa, what was, what was my, my pitch? Was it the picture that I painted? Was it the passion? Was it the benefit that they're going to get? You know, is it a tax write-off for them? What is the game that, you know, we're playing here and how can I set them up for success, which is also going to set me up for success? It's like this reciprocative, unique conversation. And once you have a little bit of success, you're like, okay, let me fine tune the way I delivered that. Let me trim the edges a little bit. Let me shine this. Let me tenderize the soil a little bit so I can pr have a better presentation each time and I just love the way you described that. And you overcame the resistance of the no and you got a couple yeses. You started building that momentum. And then Ryan, what came next? Then like did pressure so arise at all? Cause now you had this pocket of money and you're like, Oh man, I really have to figure out how to deliver on this now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was going through that. Pro I mean, I was totally under underfunded for capital floats. And that was more of my not really understanding what it was going to cost to get a float center open. And so, which in the reality, I'm very great. I was able to navigate it and get it done. Um, but I'd kind of, I'd received money and it was through basically family and friends around, um, you know, people, a friend that I knew growing up and I, you know, get back in contact with, and then, you know, people he's connected to. So it just kind of happened. Um, you know, and, and back to the point of like why they got into it. I look back of like anyone, anyone that's listening, it's like raising money. It's like, yeah, you need to do your homework. You need to do your diligence into like presenting at the end of the day, anyone that's investing is investing in you. And it's about, you know, like you said, your word, like does your word match your action? And I just want to harp on like for it, everything I've learned and raising money or getting people in. It's like, it comes down to, do they believe in actually what you're going to do? Um, and making sure that our actions are matching that. And I always think back to, there's a pod, it was on, I think how I built this and this is the common theme of people raising money. It's like, they always talk like, okay, you got no told no to a hundred times by, you know, different people. Um, but then you eventually got a yes. Why? And they're always like, well, we actually just did what we said we were going to do in the pitch. So we pitched the company. We said, here's our plan for the next year. This is where we're going to go. Um, or this is what we're going to attempt to do. Cool. We're not interested. They call back, you know, the, the, the year goes by, they reach back out to the funding company, the venture firm. What have you guys done? Oh, we literally said what we were going to do. We're interested. Like that's how most deals get done. Unless you have the most unique idea and you've been this founder that's launched multiple companies, it's literally about just doing what you say you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And that is where magic happens. And it's not, it's really not that complicated. Um, so I think that's like the piece to it. And then for me, raising that money, it became, man, it was just every day doing something that was just moving the process forward. I remember building out cap. I, I didn't have any money. I was um, like, personally, I put all my money into this company. I'd maxed out credit cards. I would go to San Francisco, moved to Sacramento to start Capital Floats and would go to San Francisco to drive Lyft and drive like 16 hour days, drive back home, wake up. And then I'd be at, you know, it started with trying to find a building. I remember we were needing to find a building. We couldn't, I couldn't convince. That was a whole journey that I went on of like landlords. A concept, this is back in 2014, 2015. Float tank, there was no float center in Sacramento. So this con most people don't even know what that was. So they're like, why would I give my building to you? Like why, you know, this is a big, yes, you might pay me, but like, I need to, I need to know that you're not going to go bankrupt. 
You know, they're not really protected if a company goes bankrupt from a landlord perspective. So I had to get, again, selling them that, hey, I'm going to do this. I will make this succeed. And of course, everyone says that, but it's like, how do you, how do you show that to them? Um, so we got turned down. It was like six months of getting turned down. I looked at every building in Sacramento, nothing, nothing came through. And then my, one of the guys that invested in me in the company and cap good buddy of mine, he decided to purchase a building and he was launching another company and it just really, you know, went from no prospects to, Oh my God, we're moving forward. We have a building and we need to get this going overnight basically. And so then it was, you know, that's everything changes in an instant. And then it's like, cool. Now we're into like contractor mode. How do we get contractors materials? Like, you know, all the vendors and getting things specked out. Cause it was so focused on what was at hand was we need a building to actually do this. There's no point in getting a contractor involved. There's no point in, you know, buying the float tanks and doing all the stuff. We have to, we have to get a building and a home to do this. So it's, you know, each process it varied. And I, you know, through that run, I, I took myself to the limit. Like that was a, that was a very challenging window for myself. Learned a lot on, you know, ideally balancing myself in, you know, I think I've learned a lot from starting plunge in comparison to capital floats and kind of what I went through. Um, but yeah, it was always that pressure of, for me, it was like, I didn't want to let down the investors. Like these people gave me their money. Like I knew them personally. Mm -hmm. It was like, I am going to figure this out to make sure that like you bought into me and I, I, I'm not going to let you down. And like that, that drove me that drove me to the finish line. Trident Coffee is sponsoring this episode of the Invictus Mindset Podcast. My guys over at Trident taught me something really important this last year, that we are all a bundle of stories, both good and bad and everything in between. At Trident, they're storytellers. All of their cold brews remind their customers that, that they are part of something bigger than themselves. They help create connections through symbology and storytelling that engage their customers on an emotional level, and this distinguishes them from other coffee brands. You can find Trident in Imperial Beach and in Coronado. They offer over 14 plus nitro cold brews along with dairy-free options. You can find the perfect brew and pair it with one of their treats from their keto bakery. All these options will allow you to support your health and fitness journey with Trident Coffee. They're more than just a coffee company. You can check them out over at tridentcoffee.com and use code INVICTUS20 for 20% off online and in tap rooms. Once again, that's tridentcoffee.com. Use code INVICTUS20 for 20% off online and in tap rooms. Take your coffee experience to the next level. Two important factors for us over at Invictus Mindset are true care and attention to detail. My friends over at RX Mark here have been bringing innovative fitness tools to the market since 2009. From their award-winning Evo speed ropes, to their amazing gymnastics grips, to their line of inflatable fitness equipment, they're constantly looking to problem solve within the fitness industry. They're always allowing us to have our gear work for us rather than against us. Hop on over to RX Mark Gear and use discount code Invictus Mindset to shop their latest cutting edge gear. Have your gear work with you and not against you. Finding these these unique moments where people are sacrificing for the greater good of humanity. And I mean that's what I feel like exercise is. That's what I feel like, you know, trying to do the right thing when nobody is watching. All of these yeah. things add up to that philosophical concept of sweep the sheds, which is super cool. I think it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory what 1% better every day means, but I'd love to explore the concept of move heavy or move fast and break shit. That one really, really aligns with me as well. And I think, I don't know, it, it's cool because I, I think in order to create true change, you got to be gently disruptive. And that's yeah. exactly what you guys are kind of doing with the streetwear apparel and aesthetic component to, to functional fitness apparel. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a, um, so <clears throat> move fast break shit was termed, which is like foul forward, dare to think differently. Nothing's impossible. Um, and, and when I go back to like, 
you know, sportswear with a street aesthetic, you know, we felt like, obviously we felt that, you know, no one really did that. You either were street or you were either sport. And we were like, how, well, what, why? Like, well, what's stopping us doing this if we're passionate about it? And what's why stopping us Why can't you be both? Stand? Why not stand for something, right? Like I love wearing an oversized fit tee with a pair of rev shorts and I literally can throw down in that or I could take it off and put a sportswear tank on as well as have my, you know, sportswear shorts. Like, you know what I mean? There's no, there's no limitations. Um, and where it applies every day, I suppose, is, you know, we, we have to make decisions every day. Like every day we have to make decisions as a team or an individual because, you know, everyone has their role to do in the team. And if we're going to grow and move forward and push boundaries, you're going to fail, right? Like you're going to fail and you've got to fail forward. So if you don't open, in my opinion, up that area for opportunity to fail and then look at it and go, where did we go wrong so we can learn from it? And they're just small things. It could be, let's test something on social media. Let's test this real. Let's, you know, it's not just about the big strategies. Like you, you got to try things which then form into big things. It's the small things you do every day that you make a decision, whether it's through marketing, um, you know, to a piece of content on socials, to a digital ad, to a, you know, how you're working with a potential new athlete because, you know, you feel there's an alignment there and, you, you know, you really want to work with them. You're testing to see if there's that, like synergies together um, to a, a whole a whole new product that you're developing. Like there's just so many things that you can apply it to every day that you have to make decisions. Um, and then it goes back to then, well, <clears throat> with say the value created community, it's like, well, how do we make sure it ties back to that value of creating a community? Because if we're going to move fast and break shit and give it a go, we got to make sure we're still creating a community because that's just as important, which then makes you be 1% better you know, it, it flows on and, and, and how you do that. And is there a better way to do it? Well, let's see if there is and find it. Um, and then you tie it back to our mission is, does it inspire people to chase the vibe? Are we inspiring our community? Like, because if we're just doing it because we want to get views or we're doing it because we want to look cool, that's not the way to do it then because you've got to make sure it goes back to that because it's not about being cool. It's about tying it back to the mission. So it's like, it's really crazy to watch how each individual value has kind of got tied together. So we'll be in a conversation that I might be a part of with the team and we'll be talking about something we're going to do for the week, you know, in our daily marketing whip or that, you know, if I, if I jump into a marketing whip with the team and, and, and me, I love marketing. Like I spent a lot of time with, I, I, we, we, we only got ahead. We only had a head of marketing start in April, you know, at, at really like we, we didn't have a head of marketing or, a marketing manager in the brand. It was just, it, there was all different team members, but I was I work with them every day, and they have the autonomy, um, you know, to to build something. So I think you know, like, but it's always we go back to those terms. Like, if we've got an idea, we always go back into is it does it help us create a community because that's just as important around essentially the customer. Like, if that's the most important thing, our community is why we're here and who we work for. So. If it doesn't, then probably don't do it like because you're just doing something for the wrong reasons because you think it's cool. And I don't think that's the way to be doing things. So it's it, it all kind of ties back into each other when you're asking those questions. Um, yeah, and that's where Move Fast Break shit comes in. Should we do it? Well, you don't have competition. You set the standard. You may as well do it and let's go, you know. So, yeah, it, 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 that's kind of where it all kind of formed in together as a team and how we kind of created it. Um, and it kind of goes piece by piece as you're asking questions around when you need to make a decision. Um, because a lot of it, the, the thing that can slow things down is decision making. I believe, you know, if you can't make a decision, mm -hmm. then how are you going to, that bottlenecks a lot for sure. A, you know, a lot. And I think a lot of big businesses, um, that's where they, that, they, you know, they hurt is because, and as a brand growing quite quickly, we have to also be 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 very self aware that we you know we can't let that get in the way as well. But you've got to put great process in for the team, but you also want to have that great direction for them so they can they can move fast and and, and do things to keep growing and, and and that helps them grow in their career, which I think is really important is career progression for them as well. And that's something we you know we really want to work hard on is if we can build a global brand. We can build global careers, which I think is amazing. Um, and our, our, our little Aussie brand out of Logan uh, can hopefully create global careers and, you know, build a global community, which is our goal. Um, and what we're working on, I think, would be, you know, that's the most inspiring thing as well. So, Yeah, for sure, Jason. 
It, it's super rad to me that you're thinking big picture like that. Um, stealing from the famous thought leader, James Clear, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. And it sounds to me like you're instilling optimal systems so your team members can have not only positive contribution, but pursue a growth tra trajectory. Because humbly between you and I, and I've discussed this with a lot of people way smarter than me, but stagnation is a form of hell. It's probably hell's waiting room when you're in the same place you are year after year, kind of swimming around in a fishbowl, not really going anywhere. And to see the growth and evolution of LSKD, you know, stems from your leadership of empowering others, creating optimal systems, and then sitting in with people to ask better questions and then do this little thing called get out of the way. Let the experts be the experts. And sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But where I'm very curious here is most startups don't necessarily fail. They run out of money. And so, you know, humbly, what I'm very curious about is, you know, you have such a calm demeanor about you, but you're managing, you're, you're spinning a lot of different cups nonstop. You've got a growing family. You've got young kids. You've got some personal goals, not just as a father, but also as a husband, also as an athlete, as a leader, and as, as a human being. I'm sure there's internal spiritual work and things that you do to stay so even keel and level, which I really admire. But, you know, I love the visionary side of things. I love the Disney-like conversations. I love the, the pursuit of empowerment and the storytelling. It's so fun to me. But then you get into the CFO conversations the financial bits, the return on investments to investors or private equity people. How do you manage all of that? And, you know, yeah, how have I mean, you kind of gotten your feet wet in the organization and structure of the finances? It's a great question because it, it's easy to share that and the passion, but you've got to have that side. And I think I was lucky enough. I mean, our CFO, Matt, he started in, uh, actually, funny enough, August 2018, he started a day a week. Uh, he's now full time. Um, and uh, when he started, I, I really wanted to understand the financial side of the business, to be honest. I, you know, I had family in the business. They're no longer in the business anymore. Um, you know, I didn't I did. I, I needed to really learn that side of it. And uh, I was so lucky when I met Matt. We actually had a government grant pay for him a day a week. So I had a government grant that paid for half of him. I think it was like twenty thousand dollars and I put in twenty. Because we, we were literally at a point when I said we weren't doing that well, we really couldn't afford to hire anyone else or put anyone in. And I'd never had anyone at that level. I didn't know what a CFO did. If I'm completely transparent, it wasn't that long ago, I didn't really know what a CFO did. So when I think back then, and it sounds easy to talk about it now, um, he spent a lot of time teaching me how to read a P&L, cash flow forecasting, planning, margin, which allowed me to understand where to put my time and energy to know that we could keep reinvesting. I mean, we're a self-funded business. So, you know, we self-funded our growth. And part of that is being understanding and obsessed with that side of it as well, because it, it's got, it's art and science. You know, the art and science is really important. You've got to have the art and you've got to have the science and you've got to bring almost those two brains together. And I'm just so lucky when I met Matt that he brought the science and I was like, I have this passion and I, and, I, and, and, and I got to learn the science, but I'm also constantly learning. I spend so much time in the financial side with our CFO and the teams. And we share a lot with our teams. We share our P&L with the teams. Um, we you know, do a lunch and learn on it to show where we're going as a brand and our growth. And yeah, I mean, that, that, that side of it is really important if you want to grow because to, to grow, you've, you, know, you either have to do those or you've got to make sure you're profitable enough to keep funding growth. Uh, and, and that's something that, you know, we're, you know, thankfully we've been in a, a position to do that. Um, and, you know, with the right people around and, you know, you've got to understand that side of it. It's, it's really important. And, um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time on it all the time. Uh, so, you know, you've got to have both sides. I think it's really important. The art and science is, is really important and, and surround yourself with the right people there. Um, and, and, and Matt's played a big part in that journey. It's, um, you know, of, of being a part of that, of, you know, making sure, you know, where we need to be as we keep investing in growth in terms of, you know, when, and then investing in growth, it means actually you have to buy more product, um, you know, because if, if you don't have product, you can't sell product to your community, 
which then helps you to keep growing and then investing in growth in your team and your team's development, um, infrastructure, whether it's tech, whether it's, you know, our fulfillment center, we've built out our fulfillment center with, with all new racking again um, on another side with high picking. So, you know, we've had to invest in all that side of it. So we've, you know, got about 3,000 square meters of uh, fulfillment center at the moment and we're probably almost outgrown it already again. Um, which is, which is fun and, a, and another part of the journey, which is constantly figuring out the next steps. But also you've got to be smart, right? You're a business. You have to be smart with cash flows. So, yeah, I think that plays a big part in it as well. It's a, it's a great question because it, you can hear that side of it, but you've really got to have, have – and not every, I suppose, founder or entrepreneur is interested in that all the time. You've, so it's like for me, I love building something and being a part of something – but also when I took that step and really wanted to learn that side of it and I found, you know, you know, having an amazing CFO and, 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 and the way he shares and develops the team as well has really helped me to learn at the same time um, and know where I can put, where to put my time and energy um, because you only have a short amount of time in a day to get stuff done. And I think that's, you know, like anyone in, in, in their career or if they're starting a brand or a business, you can, you can be doing 40 different things, but if you honed in and did one thing great, where will that take you? Do you, know, you, can't be, you can't do everything at once. And, that, and that's something I had to learn over the years as well. I thought I could do a bunch of different things and do it all great, but then you run out of time. Uh, and then you run out of brain, you know, power in the mind to do it all because you're constantly thinking. And I kind of had to strip everything back and just focus on one thing. Um, and was like, just be great at one thing uh, and not try to be everywhere. And that everywhere was, sell, you know, making all these different categories. And I got to learn a lot about technical product, making like water sports, wakeboarding jackets and all that stuff was actually great for my career um, and learning about technical product. But it also was very distracting at the time because I was just trying to do all these things. And I think that plays, a, you know, why, we, why we're here today and lucky enough to experience all that um, because, you know, you, you, you've only got a certain amount of time in a day to get something to, 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 to achieve something. So I love hearing the way you describe that Jason, because from the outside looking in, it's like, man, like we talked about the cool stuff, the, the mission, the values, managing a team, managing people, you know, then we got into some of the messy stuff, which is understanding finances and cash flowing and where to reinvest and hiring a CFO you know, the process of, of getting a government grant and finding ways to, you know, funnel cash flow into the reinvestment of more valuable team members. But then if you even look deeper, it's like materials, design, marketing, production, timeline, organization of all these different things. I'm looking at it and I'm just like a kid in a candy store looking at all the different shiny objects. Like, how does this guy do what he does? And it's cool to hear how you have narrowed your focus, acquired team members to then delegate, and then you're finding ways to manage your time and your energy more efficiently, kind of leaning a little bit more on your strengths and then trusting to learn from, from the experts around things that don't necessarily light your fire, but you want them to over time. Yeah, and, and if I look back, like I've spent a lot of time in every department, every department over this 15 years in production and, 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 and even the fulfillment, freight, you know, logistics. I got to spend time in all those departments over the years because I was helping do a bit of everything because when you're only a small team of when it all started, you know, to, you know from my mum's bedroom, you've kind of helping do everything. So you kind of get to learn a lot of the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Um and then as you get bigger, you can hire, you, you then bring on team members to really support that know a lot more than you, um, which is the best thing because then you start learning. Um, <clears throat> if I look at my time today, I do spend a lot of time in, in, in production design, planning, marketing. I do spend a lot of my time around that. Um, you know, now we've got a retail store and we're opening another one. Well, we've got, we're going to have three in December. We've got our one at our HQ. We've got one in Chatston and then another one opening at Chermside and then another one in, in, in March next year, Miranda. Um, I get to spend time in stores. I was in Melbourne last week and I was spending time with the store teams and learning there as well. So I'll be on the road learning probably once a week and spending time in store and learning, meeting the community. And, you know, because when you're in an office, it can, uh, it's a bubble sometimes too. So 
But I spent a lot of my time in those areas because product's so important for the community as well. And me constantly learning around product and product development and raw materials. Uh, I was recently overseas, um, you know, visiting a supplier with our team as well. So I, I get to do that too, which is great. And spending time with a new supplier, um, which was amazing. I was in Sri Lanka for a week and it was so cool to, you know, now that travel's kind of back, it's amazing to go spend time with your suppliers and, and the relationship you have with them because they're so important a part of it and their goals for sustainability and what they're doing in production and, you know, and, and, and their innovation and their goals. And, and it, 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 it's, it's, it's really cool. I mean, I, I get to, I get to see a lot in the brand every, every day. Um, so I spent a lot of time across every areas and it's not that I don't like departments. I would say that it's the fact of, I, I, I have to spend, I spend time in areas that I know that can really support different teams at certain times. Um, as I said on Friday, I was in the fulfillment center chatting and, and mm-hmm. making sure if they need help, like it, it, you know, I'll, I'll go wherever they need me. You know, it's just, it's just what you do and, and spend time with as many different team members as I can. And I get a little bit slack on my email sometimes because I'd rather be with the team uh, than responding to emails. Sometimes I'm a bit slack there because I am just more just in it with everyone and learning. And I think that's, you know, I think Jim Collins said that 40% of a leader's time, you know, especially a founder or CEO's time, is spending it with the team so you can learn where it's going wrong and, and, and improve. And, you know, and I like that, I, I, you know, I, I love being a part of it. Jason, that's super cool, man. I think I, I definitely align with, uh, slacking on email a little bit because I'm trying to observe, you know, what's going on in our space. How can we better serve our members? What are the trends that are going on? Um, and I just prefer to be able to define context in person because, Humbly, I believe words are an approximation of what we're actually trying to convey. And I think sometimes yeah. on a keyboard or, or written on a Slack or something, it gets misunderstood a little bit. And uh, yeah, there, there, there's a yeah. lot of alignment there for sure. You can probably hear my Slack in the background going off. I forgot to turn it on mute, this podcast. But yeah, you're right. I mean, if you need to just give them a call or go see them, you know, that's like, you know. But I mean, we, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it's uh, and you also got to have open communication with your team. I think it's really important that you can be transparent with each other when things aren't going right and, and keeping that. And but they can also be transparent back to you. It can't be one way. You've really got to create that environment. But yeah, it's uh, spending time with the team and learning because there's always something going on and there's always new things to learn. And if you want to be better, you've got to constantly improve. And how do you improve is by finding new ways and, and being in it and and learning so and then being out there in the community that's why i love training you know part of how we found ourselves with with our mission as well as i was a part of a fitness community you know a, a fit stop uh they've just launched in the us and uh a good friend of mine was the founder of that brand and we used to race moto together and they've got a, about a hundred locations here in australia now and you know i, I watched him start it from his garage um pete and um yeah, and I, and I got to be a part of that too and training and understanding the power of being a part of fitness communities and functional fitness as a whole. Um, and when you look back at, you know, when you were talking about athletes and how we've moved into the CrossFit community, I look back at our time in motocross and I was so lucky to sponsor some of the best motocrossers in Australia uh, and traveled the world and realizing I got to work with athletes and travel. I traveled to America to spend time at the AMA with athletes and I actually kind of got to almost be involved in all that to when we've moved into different sports and how we kind of don't force our way in. It's, it's got to happen organically and really build that community over time. Um, I got to kind of learn that in other sports as we've kind of, and, and I've found a lot of different athletes from action sports have moved into functional fitness or CrossFit or, you know, whether it's different sports like marathons or all these different um, sports once they've finished, that's also happened as well. Uh, because, you know, they're trying to find that next uh, pursuit of putting themselves through the hurt locker, I think. But, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of that whole evolution. <laughs> of being a part I love of that analogy, different- hurt locker, that you've referenced. It just, it's so cool <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind putting myself in that sometimes, you know. It's, uh, it hurts, but it's it, it's a level up. <laughs> it's cool, though. <laughs> yeah. You got to go yeah. there a little bit to seek to understand, to explore, to know what it feels like, to resonate with with athletes and you know it makes you really really connect with the community and i love that slogan behind you around creating community and our community is why we are here and who we work for
We have the MCT oil, we have the monk fruit, so we have really good sweetener that is shown to be you know, zero, uh, no glycemic load. And then the MCT oil is a really great healthy fat that can, you know, basically will feed your brain for the, instead of having sugar, you can use this short chain, medium chain fat. Mm -hmm. And so all those benefits are, are there and have been really f found out in the past like 10 years. People have been kind of using these things and figuring things out. And you know, it's one of the best ways for me to drink coffee. And one, if I do intermittent fasting, just complements it so well. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, for me, it's, it's a huge benefit because like I probably drink more than I should on the coffee standpoint, but it's great to start that morning off with an MCT oil coffee and then um, I'm really good for, you know, several hours and I can have my first meal for sure. And I, and it's sustaining too. It's not that like quick jolt followed by the crash. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I also want to, you know, share some love and kind of point people cause you and I have great conversations all the time around, you know, some of the research associated with intermittent fasting and MCT oil and some of the lifestyle factors that, you know, come from the integration of, of a nice little jolt kickstart of coffee and, you know, Andrew Huberman does a great job of referencing those things. Mm -hmm. Peter Atia does a great job referencing those things. Dr. Rhonda Patrick. There's so many people out there that are in alignment with this, and you're constantly doing your research, mm -hmm. right? You're not one of those stagnant CEOs that's like, nah, I got to figure it out. It's my way or the highway. It's like you're always evolving. You're layering on top. Maybe that worked. Maybe it didn't. You're always like asking the right questions and seeking to understand within the field, and that keeps you kind of on this really, really nice upward trajectory, you know? Well, like you said, the, the, the day you think you know everything is the day you're screwed. Mm -hmm. Like the day you stop learning is you're, you know, just put a fork in it, you're done. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we've tried stuff that hasn't worked. You know, I think I've had way more failures than I've had successes just because you have to try stuff. You have to push the boundary a little bit. You have to figure out what works, what doesn't, um, especially in the space where there, there, isn't, there isn't really somebody to look to. There isn't a, a model like, yeah, let's just follow these guys and just kind of do it a little bit differently. So with us kind of pushing the limit on cold brews that we've had to learn things, we've had to learn how to do the draft systems. We had to learn how to do the brewing, how to learn, make sure we get the right water profile. All these things were through trial and error and always just trying to research how to do it better. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, I think we do it from a, a physical standpoint. Hey, what, what foods can we, eat? what exercises can we do? Can we do cold plunge? Can we do sauna? Can we do this? Can we do that? And it's always just trying to make ourselves better. And the same thing goes with the product. So yeah. it's just, you know, kind of dovetails into each other very nicely. This episode is brought to you by Mush. My friends over at Mush created an incredibly cool product of ready to eat overnight oats. And for those of you that listen to the podcast often, you know, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And Mush has done just that as their products have no more than seven clean ingredients that are dairy free, gluten free with no added sugar. Mush started right here at Invictus as they had a vision to create convenient, healthy, and clean nutrition. And this landed them on Shark Tank, where the famous Mark Cuban invested in them. Now they're found in retailers all over the country, including Costco, Sprouts, Target, and Whole Foods. Check out my friends over at www.eatmush.com. Some of the best members I've had were actually you know, joking with buddies in the military about something probably shouldn't have joked about, but like that innate sense of dark humor is how you're able to bond and connect. Um, and so those, like once you have those bonds, like they don't go away. Like I can, I can not see one of my friends for five, 10 years and then come back in my life. We just pick it up just like that. I love that you can just pick up right where you left off. Cause sometimes with this, this mechanical box in our mm -hmm. pocket, it's like, Hey, why don't you text me back? Yeah. It's like, no, the best relationships are like, Oh yeah, life got busy. You got buried in my text chain. I got back to you six months later, and I'm still laughing about what you texted me. <laughs> no, because as I said, fortunately, if you if you're the social media side of it, it's it, it's starting to get a little bit better. But it normally, it's like somebody's highlight reel, right? So you're yeah. talking about seasons. If all you're seeing is the up, and you're not necessarily seeing what's down, is like you think something's wrong with you. It's like, well, I mean, I'm I'm not in the best place right now. Like that's okay. There's seasons to this thing. There's there's ups and downs. There's it's a roller coaster for sure. And so that's the only downside I think with that is that it's conditioning people to only see the highlight side of the house, right? You're only posting your PRs. You're only doing this. You're only doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people scroll through their, you know, five, 10,000 followers, whatever they do, all they see is highlight reels. They're like, oh shit, like maybe I'm not doing well. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm Am not. Am I good enough? Do I have imposter syndrome? Where, yeah. where, where do I fall in the landscape? And, and so and I think there's comparison. The comparison piece, I think, is the, the worst aspect of, of, of what social media does. And so if you can... Um, like you said, stop, be still, knowing that there is evolution, but 
you know, there's, there's seasons, there's tides, there's, there's, you look at mother nature like that, that just doesn't stay still, mm -hmm. always changing. And that's okay. Like that's, that's part of it. But I think it's just finding time to look in that and reflect on it and not have to worry about like, go, 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 hustle, hustle, hustle. Cause again, it's, it's not sustainable. For sure. Another thing that I, I really think about within this conversation is this element of listening. Listening is not just the words that are spoken. That's hearing, in my opinion. If you're feeling anxious, you're feeling depressed, try to listen to that whisper. Seek the root cause of that. And like you mentioned with habits, what, what are the habits that maybe led to that? If I wasn't feeling that previously and I'm feeling that now, what, what took place between those two things? What was in the black box between input and output as you described? And, and listening is such a beautiful art right? Because it's observing body language. It's seeing the contrast of facial expressions. It's seeing how do they lean in? Do they lean away? And, and I think there's a uniqueness to that because you could apply that to business, right? Like what is the consumer saying about the product? You know, what is the employee saying about our conversation and my leadership style? The word listen is a very powerful word in, in our world. And I think I, th I think you can unpack that to so many different levels. What do you think about when I say listen? Uh, I, I think people go back to just hearing, you know, uh, the the understanding piece. So if, you, if you're talking to listening to that context, it is the understanding piece, right? Is putting, trying to put yourself in that other person's perspective because that is what empathy is, you know, feeling what somebody else is feeling. I think it's very challenging right now for a lot of people. Um, you know, we're we're in our own little bubble, it is hard for us to kind of break out of that. There's been so much anxiety, so much unknown for the past several years that, you know, people maybe not be acting out of the, the, the most abundant mindset. They might be acting a little bit of scarcity, you know? And so that I think it definitely creates barriers to listening, understanding, and actually hearing what somebody has to present to themselves. So I think it's, you know, finding that time to be there, be present with them and really try to understand them. Yeah, for sure. If if I'm listening to the current trajectory of of Trident Coffee, I'm I'm anticipating in the next few years a pretty pretty big boom in a positive way. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you think comes next for Trident? You know, it's constant connection, the products continue to develop, the team starts to get a little bit bigger. You're now across, I think you said 26 states. Mm -hmm. Like what's to come next for you and this incredible brand that has developed so fast, man. Well, I think, I think it's just doing what we do. You know, like if you've got something that you're doing well, continue to do that, but always look for ways to do it better. But at the same time, it's like being organic with what we're, what we're offering. You know, we have this really unique concept where no one else is doing it. It provides a really cool brand to people that are just used to getting a dark roast coffee or a light roast or a mocha with this. Um, and so adding that, you know, layers to it, uh, as people become more familiar with it and they start telling their friends, like that organic growth is something really exciting for us. Uh, but we just want to keep doing what we're doing in a way with connecting with people like yourself because it's so fun. Like if, if we're doing this and we're not having fun, we're like we're, we're messing up big time. Totally. We have such an opportunity here to be and hang around with amazing people because a lot of people love coffee and we can be that for those people and then connect with them, engage with them, listen to them, hear their story and build an amazing brand that people love because it's, they feel it. Yeah, for sure. And so that's the biggest thing is that if you can create that emotional connection, you, you have those super fans and that's something that we want to bring. Like we're trying to build this tribe out. So they're speaking our language. They're, they're doing, you know, they're active. They're thinking about the, the stories. They're thinking about all the lessons that we have to take, you know, with whether the storm is a perfect example the coffee itself comes from the Malabar coast in India that suffers monsoon season. Mm. So the coffee itself has to weather the storm to get through the harvest season. And then for us, that's just life too, right? There's sometimes that there's stuff that gets thrown your way that is just going to bring you to your fucking knees. Yeah, it is. It's okay. So whether that storm gets through, there's th the sun's going to shine on that the next, the next day or two. And so it's just, it's very challenging for sometimes when, Again, you see the highlights. You don't see what humans go through on a day-to-day -day basis, which is a lot of ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Like I said, like last two weeks, we've had so much equipment break and you're always trying to fix it, go through there. So it's like, okay, just weather the storm, weather the storm. And so it's just like a mantra at our shop because again, if you don't, like what's, what, you're going to fade away and die? Like that's not the, that's not the option. Mm -hmm. Endure. Yeah. So. I love that. I also, I just finished Cameron Haynes' book around Endure. Okay. Super cool. If you haven't checked it out, this is a gentleman that runs a marathon every day. 
Still has a nine to five job. Hmm. He's like the hardest motherfucker on the planet with uh, David Goggins. <laughs> they go back and forth. Rogan talks about those guys hmm. all the time. But the other thing that's super cool about this concept of endure is in order to grow, in order to evolve, you got to continue to enhance capital. And you've built some really amazing relationships with people. One of them I was fortunate to have on the show, Dante Whitner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody that I talk to just, they speak volumes of Trident Coffee. And they're so positive in, in their impact and their connection with you and the brand. What, is, what does it mean to you to continue to build these relationships and enhance capital so that way you guys can continue to grow on a monetary component? Well, it's funny. It goes, it goes back to when you focus on what you have in, in, in commonality with a lot of people. Like, I don't like Dante and I have anything in common besides, uh, you know, <laughs> NFL player. That's a, um, that's a more complicated, um, uh, like, discussion honestly with with sponsor of athletes just because it's such a it's a it's a broad scope in the sense that we actually don't sponsor athletes anymore we used to we, mm -hmm. we used to sponsor gosh i think we had probably one of the biggest rosters back in the day you know five or six years ago um of all the top athletes um probably next to rogue you know i think uh we had we had quite a bit and and we're just a tiny company you know and mm -hmm. and with an accessory product right like a jump rope being the the primary uh product that we were hoping to get some some promotion for um, it's, an, it's an accessory product. They don't use it every day. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to really justify, you know, those type of sponsorship relationships to, to try and, you know, promote the product. So, um, you know, we had to, we really did a full shutdown of how we were dealing with athletes, uh, for us, as far as like where we saw getting a return mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know what, we don't ever want to have to pay somebody to use our product mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, uh, there, there were a handful of athletes that were only using it because they were getting paid. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm not necessarily from us, but there were some athletes that I know were going to other companies and using their product because they were getting a sponsorship, you know, contract, uh, and, and some monetary support there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then they would message me behind the scenes, like, well, I still use your rope. I like your rope better. And I'm mm -hmm. like, ah, I wish you didn't tell me that. Cause yeah. like, I would never want to work with you if that's, you know what I mean? Like, even though that was a kind of a compliment, you liked our product better. But, you know, I, I just, um, I don't ever want to pay an athlete to use our product. A, because I think it's too important for the athlete. Like, they need to use what they feel gives them the best opportunity to perform and to win, right? Mm -hmm. So I want them to choose ours genuinely because they feel it does. Mm -hmm. And so that in itself is a, is a win for me. Like, great. That person believes in our product. I love it. And so those are the people we're looking for that really believe in our product. And The other um, thing I want to note there that you do a really good job of, too, is... If somebody uses a product and they think that it can be better, you're always incredibly receptive to feedback. Sure. And I've seen firsthand where somebody's given you feed feedback on a particular product. You've taken that feedback, gotten in the lab, and then came back with a product that was actually better and exceeded the expectations that they were looking for. Sure. They're the ones using it, right? Like for they, sure. They're, they're the ones that use it. And so they, they know better in the heat of battle, like how it feels and how it's responding and, and, and whatnot. So yeah, you'd be silly not to take their, their input on, on things. So, um, yeah. So we, yeah, we stop, we, we, we don't like, we don't sponsor athletes at all. And when people always ask, cause it, it's just kind of the common lingo, like, Hey, is that your athlete? Is this your athlete? I'm, I always say, well, no, we have a friendship with them. We have, we have a partnership with them, if you will. Like we do provide them, we'll give them free gear if they believe in it. Um, and, and we ask nothing in return. Like we, we don't ask them to post about it. The one thing we realized too, uh, is, you know, athletes are really good at training and competing and performing. They're not really necessarily, not necessarily good at promoting your product, right? Mm -hmm. And to ask them to be good at promoting your product is kind of a reach. Um, and, and the thing is, is that it's not really what their audience wants to hear either. So it's a detriment to them mm -hmm. that they're out there like pushing whatever it might be, their jump rope, you know? Uh, so I just feel like that it's a, it's a lose-lose for them and for us because, they're not getting the message through to their audience. We're not, you know, picking up a new customer because of it. So the best thing that could happen for us is that the athlete really believes in our product. They use it religiously. They use it in training. They use it in competition. And, you know, their audience will see that. It'll mm -hmm. come out. It'll show on the floor. It's organic. It's Very authentic. Organic. And, yep. and, and I think you do a really good job of fostering relationships. I mean, I, I loosely wrote it down here, but just some of the people that I've crossed paths with over the last few months, Alex Smith, Annie Sakamoto, Easy Muhammad, Sam Dancer, Dave Durante. Like these are all people that 
we're not just sitting here spitballing products. We're talking about the depth of relationship mm-hmm. that you have with them and specific experiences that you've had with them. And sometimes the products are a part of that. Sometimes they aren't. Right. But what gravitates us and me towards you is who you are as a human and who your brand represents as people first. Right. Will you, will you touch on that a little bit? You're so diligent about the importance of relationships in your life. And I, I'm so thankful to be a part of that. But that is a huge methodology for you guys. And it just happens organically. No, I appreciate that. You know what? And and it is it is natural because I think um, we just care about other people, right? Like, and if you care about other people, um, it, it comes around. You know, it's it, it's obviously a, a form of karma, but you know, um, it, it it's nice to care about other people and and help them in their endeavors, help them in their their journeys, and all those people that you just rattled off. I mean, I'm humbled because they're phenomenal uh, human beings. Uh, in so many different ways. I mean, they're just amazing people and, and very accomplished, uh, but very caring people themselves. You know, like that's the thing. It's like, I think maybe like attracts like. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, like I know that I can call on any one of those people at any time and just say, hey, having a bad day and just, you know, feeling down, just want to chat. And they would take my call and be, oh, yeah. be happy to write, be happy to talk to you. So, um, yeah, it's just it's just nice to to care about other people as humans first. And, you know, w- what happens after the fact is, is, is great. You know, that's, that's just all kind of like getting through life and all the minutia. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, I think that's important to have those relationships. And that's, that's how we are with the athletes that we don't sponsor now, the athletes that we want to support. And, uh, and we do find ways to find, uh, support them financially. Um, and basically it's just paying for their time. If we're going to spend time with them and, and use them in some way to, to in promotion of our, our company, our products, then we want to pay them for that. So we'll, we'll find, you know, either we'll pay them for a photo shoot or we'll pay them to, you know, get involved with a campaign or whatever it might be. But, um, it's always a case by case scenario, but you know, we will never pay somebody to, to use our, our product. And that's just a, a hard stance that we're, we've taken and, and it, and it, and it just, it's made such a better relationship. I mean, we're right now we're sending out ropes. Uh, I haven't posted it yet, but I took a, a fun video and photo of these real, um, we had these real custom cases. We were talking about cases mm-hmm. and I had these real fancy ones made up, you know, just cause we, we thought it'd be kind of cool to just get some different materials and patterns and things and make some real unique one-offs mm-hmm. and, uh, and put a real special rope in there and send it to all the athletes that, oh, are, that's cool. that are, yeah, they're going to the games. And I just sent the first wave of them out and we're, you know, we're probably sending out, um, uh, you know, 30 of these to athletes that are at the games. These are all individual athletes. And, you know, of the 30, guarantee you that there's a good percentage that are going to be on the podium. So they, these are some of the, you know, top, top athletes in the world. And, um, and it's just great that we just, we wanted to do that for them just, you know, because we appreciate them and mm-hmm. we want them to get excited and have something fun. It's just you know? cool to see how so, excited you're getting right yeah, now about giving yeah. them to these guys, which is super cool. I am. Yeah. Some of them, some of them, have, you know, the first wave they've, they've received them and uh, they've been sending little nice messages back out to them. And again, it's like, it's just something we like to do for them. We didn't send them a message saying, Hey, can you please post this? Can you put this out on your social media? No, this is between us. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and, uh, and it's really fun. It allows so, for roots, which, which yeah. I think are super c- crucial. And with that being said, man, what are some predictions that you have for the podium this year on the, Oof. the men's side, the women's side, and then team? Yeah. So we were, we were, yeah, you and I were talking briefly off, off camera about that, man. So men's and women's, um, I'm excited. There's going to be fireworks, assuming everybody gets to the starting line healthy. Like last year we had some, some COVID dropouts. Last yeah, second, that was a bummer. Was a bummer I hope everybody sure. stays healthy that's, this year. Knock on wood. That's what we need. Yeah. Get every to the, to the starting line and hopefully to the finish line healthy. Um, and you know, man, there's just so much star power out there. I mean, obviously Tia is still on the women's side, you know, um, you know, I, there, there are a lot of amazing athletes out there that are going to start, um, moving up the ranks and start challenging Tia. You know, when you say challenge her, I mean, I think just make her, make her work a little harder (laughs) to win again. (laughs) Mal O'Brien is somebody that maybe comes to mind. Dude. I mean, yeah, Mal is phenomenal and so young and just so much growth potential ahead of her. Like with her, it's like not even worried because she's so young and has such a long career and, you know, great coaching, great programming. I mean, all of that. So great support group, awesome family, met, met her folks uh, out at the Granite Games and they're wonderful. That's cool. Yeah. But you know, Mal O'Brien is obviously, 
um, a stud. Uh, Danielle Brandon's a stud. Um, uh, I mean, Brooks always in the run. Carl Saunders. I mean, I, I, I'm leaving out names that I know I shouldn't because they're they're all so phenomenal. So um, it's gonna be it's gonna be a crapshoot, I think, um, for second and third. Yeah, for sure. You, you briefly <laughs> mentioned Brooke Wells. Yeah. What were your thoughts on how she overcame her elbow injury this last year? Oh, man. I mean, Brittany and I were watching you know, the the semifinals where she, she qualified there. And just to see the sheer emotions mm -hmm. that came from her navigating injury and, you know, the, the panorama that probably comes through your eyesight and mm -hmm. travels through your headspace in that moment of, of the lonely rehab moments, mm -hmm. the the extra voodoo floss sessions, the physical therapy sessions, you know, the, all the things that don't get notarized. Right. W what were your thoughts kind of seeing her overcome yeah. that adversity? It was so cool. Yeah, that was, that was a, yeah, um, hugely emotional for everybody involved and everybody that knows Brooke. I mean, we've known Brooke since she was 19 years old and before she even made her first games, you know, and uh, we're, we're supporting her and, and just, you know, great, great young lady. And, um, you know, that was, that was definitely a touch and go weekend because you're used to seeing Brooke perform at such a high level and always be near the top and to see her, you know, struggling and, and just trying to qualify, uh, was really touch and go and really emotional. And you, you know, you forget like, Hey, wait a second, she was injured and yeah, she wasn't able to train like everybody else and they had to rehab. And so, you know, it, it kind of had to remind ourselves like, oh yeah, that's right. You know, she, <laughs> she's doing pretty darn good for mm -hmm. where she, where she was just, you know, six months ago or what have you. So, um, I always yeah. touch on this, but it just, it humanizes somebody yeah. that is just such a, a heroic figure yeah. in the sport. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I mean, just for her to get back there, uh, you know, I, I sent her a little note when we sent her out, you know, her little special rope and, uh, just, I got, you're already a winner. You know what I mean? Like you, you've come back from that and, and qualified back in and, and I, and we know she's going to continue to get better before, before game day. But, um, what's crazy to me is, um, you know, you've done some great things with the adaptive community as well. Mm. And, when you look at an elbow, you know, I, I battle an injured elbow as well. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those things that affects your quality of life. Mm. You're carrying something, your dog yanks you, you're trying to drink from a cup, you're mm -hmm. trying to, to just activities of daily living. You know, people don't realize, you know, as she's navigated this, mm -hmm. this injury portion of, of her life, it's more than just her performance. It's behind the scenes, comfort while sleeping. So yeah. like, there, there's a lot of different things that come along with it that I yeah. think sometimes don't get popularized. No, I think you're right. I think, yeah, we don't see, we don't see behind the curtains and what's going on and, and you're hundred percent right. So kudos to her, man. She's a stud and, um, you know, she, she, she proves that she belongs and, you know, she, she kicked butt. I mean, we, we were there in Knoxville, uh, watching her compete and yeah, it was very emotional, emotional for everybody there. So we're, we're stoked for her, but that's um, cool. I'll, I'll have to have her on the podcast and share that story firsthand. That'd be very cool. Oh, I think so. Yeah. I think people would love to hear that. I'd love to hear that and, and hear, hear her, uh, yeah, her whole story. For sure. What um, you got on the men's side? Boy, men's side, you know what? That's, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Medeiros, it, it's, he's he's still the top dog coming in and everybody anybody that comes in is going to have to uh you know take it from him obviously but there's some really strong contenders out there i mean just from you know the 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 panchik brothers uh and um velner and uh you know Guy maleros is just looking super strong um and uh gosh you know uh, Vel Fik Velner Fikow and Fikowski Fik are always Vel the Canadians. Velner, in the yeah, Adler, Velner, uh, Fikowski, Noah Olson. I mean, those uh, Travis Mayer. I mean, there's just there's so many perennial games guys that are always near the top. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, well, you know, what workouts do you get? You know what I mean? Like, what's uh, what's going to come out of the hopper that's going to be in somebody's wheelhouse? And um, you know, so what are your thoughts? Just briefly, just came to mind around the freestanding handstand push-up yeah. that we saw last year. You know, originally it was the challenge of the handstand obstacle course that led to the parallel bars. Mm -hmm. And then last year we saw the freestanding handstand push-up. The gymnastics complexity is getting up there at the games. It, you know what it really is? I was having this discussion with Alex Smith, actually. Um, I was just out with, with uh, him in Virginia a few weeks ago. And, you know, like he would really love to see backflips, you know, 
he loves like, he wants to see gymnastics gymnastics and um you know it's funny because you know crossfit's doing these really complex handstand walking obstacles and and um challenges and it's things that gymnasts don't even do it's not yeah. saying they can't do it but they don't even do these things you know and here we have these these athletes that can deadlift 500 pounds and run a you know run a five minute mile or six minute mile or doing these crazy things on their hands so uh it is getting really complex i have mixed emotions about it because some of it's kind of like just a kind of a carnival act you know a little bit of a circus trick but um, you know, cause I used to coach, my wife and I both coached competitive gymnastics, artistic gymnastics. And so we kind of come from a more traditionalist background. Um, but I got to admit it, I'm entertained. Like when I watch them and I'm, you know, watching athletes, you know, I know what it feels like when, what they're, what they're trying to accomplish. And when they get off balance, you know, they almost have that last step to, to get across parallettes and then they, you know, they get their center of gravity, you know, tilted the wrong way. I mean, I know what, I know what they feel like and it's like, oh, it's heart wrenching. But, um, so as much as I think it's kind of, uh, you know, a little bit circusy type, uh, it's entertaining cause I get, yeah. I find myself entertained. It's you know? definitely interesting to observe just, just, to challenge that a little bit though what's so frustrating for me is like i look at like a jason hopper mm -hmm. i feel like he's really athletic yeah. and that he was doing pretty well throughout the weekend and that really stunned him pretty good mm -hmm. and my question then becomes if you're going to throw gymnastics complexity when are we going to see a dunk contest for easy muhammad when are we going to see a three-point shooting contest or throwing of a ball or right. maybe like a blocking dummy that football players use where they have to continually explode into that and move it down a football field I think it's gotten a little bit biased mm -hmm. towards towards that a little bit, which is yeah. what I would challenge. Because you're right, Alex Smith would do great on a burpee backflip. Yep. Not so well on a three-point shooting contest <laughs> or a dunk contest. <laughs> right, right. And so I think it, it's interesting to look at, you know, what are the parameters that you yeah. play in with regards to testing athletes? Yeah. And uh, I don't know. It's a fun thing that we can, we can debate, you right. know, another time. But I think it's fun to kind of poke at that a little bit and see what uh, Adrian Bosman comes up with here. What are your thoughts on the team side of things? Oof, yeah, the, the, the teams, there's some solid teams. Uh, come, you know, everybody's talking about, obviously, the Mayhem and the Reykjavik, you know, kind of being the two top tier, which I understand Mayhem, obviously, um, that that team is pretty freaking amazing, especially now with Sam uh, Conyor, Con Cornier. Cormier. Yeah, Cormier, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, adding him to the squad and, you know, those ladies on that team, um, I, I forgot why I just, I start having to you know, look at some of their socials and I was seeing some of the numbers they were putting up and I didn't realize how strong they were. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Those ladies are strong. Mm -hmm. Just their deadlifts and their back squats were freaking amazing. Yeah. Um, so I mean that, you know, they're obviously the perennial, like they're the five time depending defending champions or what have you. So, you know, Reykjavik will definitely make it interesting, but you know what? Um, you know, not, not to like brown nose just because I know them and I love them all, but the Invictus team is looking really freaking strong uh, and just knowing what amazing athletes they are. Um, so I know they're going to be, I think, making some, some waves and some noise and will surprise some people. Um, Christian Ayers always has a strong team. Um, and, uh, I know, boy, there's a, a that CrossFit Oslo team that's kind of connected Oslo. under, um, former games athlete, Kristen Holte. Mm, right, right. And, and they had, uh, three of the three of them perform really well at Waterpalooza. Mm -hmm. And as, as you mentioned, I'm really excited to see, you know, what is Reykjavik able to put it together with people right. from all over the globe, kind of forming a little bit of a super team. Yep. Um, I, I saw Sam Cormier out at Wadapalooza and he was he was a stud out there. Everybody Sam's knows Rich and and the the two ladies on their team that have performed well at the games the last few years. And I'm stoked for Invictus, man. I'm I'm obviously biased, you know, to to try to be a training partner for those guys mm -hmm. and to learn and and share and watch their growth and evolution. But yeah. as far as a, a talent standpoint, you know, I've been a part of Invictus for almost eight years now, and I think they're the most talented team we've ever had. Mm. And, you know, hopefully they can, they can put it together the way I think they can. And um, it, it's just so cool to see how the sport has evolved. You yeah. know, Holden and Hunter are helping coach them now. Yeah. And we look at each other sometimes like, man, they're, they're so much better than we were when we were competing. <laughs> and like, not just their gymnastics and conditioning, but just the loads that they're able yeah. to lift. Yeah. And just the sheer athleticism, oh, manipulating yeah. external objects. It's, 
like you said, just watching the growth within human potential yeah. is just so cool on the CrossFit sport side of things. Yeah. No, they were fun to watch uh, at Granite Games. I mean, I'm glad Sue and I were able to be there and watch them watch them uh, in that event. And they, they work really well together. Like mm -hmm. they really seem like they gel well together and have good cohesiveness. So um, yeah, I'm excited for them. So I think, you know, there's, there's going to be some interesting races and, and some challenges that are, that are put up that, uh, you know, maybe people aren't paying attention to. So for sure, man, the, the, the CrossFit awesome. games are always an incredibly fun event. And I look forward to heading out there and spending time with you and Sue and yeah. building some cool memories as these athletes get after it. Oh yeah. We're going to, I think we're going to have some, some, uh, rough voices, uh, oh, yeah. after that weekend. It's going to be a lot of cheering. Oh Yeah. You know, it's been such a pleasure connecting with you today, Dave. Thanks, man. You too. And, you know, spending time with you in, in your humble headquarters that have become so amazing and evolved and all these amazing pictures around. For those of you listening, if you enjoyed my conversation, please rate, review, subscribe, and share with your friends. And as always, stay on the hunt for who you've not yet become. Till next time. Are you over 35 and in need of a solid training program? Are you looking to improve your athleticism and keep up with the younger athletes in your CrossFit gym? Then look no further than our Invictus Masters program. This program places year-round emphasis on mobility and stability exercises with movements that we have seen directly benefit our Masters athletes. Our program is led by Nicole DeHart and offers a training program designed specifically for Masters athletes who are looking to compete at a higher level in the sport of CrossFit. Some of our top Masters athletes in the world train with us, including CrossFit Games champion Kevin Kester, Matt Beals, and Pat Sprague. You can learn more about their stories and the Invictus Masters program by checking out their episodes right here on the Invictus Mindset Podcast. If you'd like more information about the current training cycle or to join the Invictus Masters program, please email Nicole at InvictusAthlete.com. That's N-I-C-H-O-L-E at InvictusAthlete.com.